Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, uh, Silburn here. I want to wish you a wonderful evening. Um, let me see if I can actually navigate this whole hiccup. There's always some sort of hiccup in in social media. Um, before I, I, I well, good evening. <coughs> good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Without further ado, I want to invite you, I want to thank you so much for um, coming on to the late one with Silburn. And uh, hope you like my setup, uh, my backdrop and everything like that. I'm in New York City today. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm in London. Um, um, this evening I've got Mr. Leroy Logan. We're going to look at some very key issues in the, in the uh, community. Um, I hope you had a wonderful Easter at the same time and had your bun and cheese and everything like that. I hope it is fine, but um, let's move it on very straightly. Um, London murder rate has overtaken New York City for the first time ever. According to a report, uh, this is the first anniversary also of the Jamaica Diaspora Crime Initiative and Prevention Task Force. Uh, tonight I'm going to have Mr. Uh, Leroy Logan, but before I invite Leroy, I just want to um, just to say that, uh, you know, Today is, um, well, Easter. Easter is a, is a, is a very lovely time. Um, and for those who are back home in Jamaica, um, Easter, you fly kite, you have your bun and cheese and everything like that, you know. Um, so I, I don't know if you guys got your bun um, and bun or you just got your bun and your cheese as well. And, and in the Caribbean, we normally have fish and um, all those sort of things. Um, so if you, if you had any fish, that would be great. I think some other um countries have chicken but we we go for fish you know um let me see something here uh okay, so uh it's a sunday night and i don't want to keep people too long really um hey fitzroy how are you doing um you good um well i'm not gonna i'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stay too long I'm just, mr mr leroy logan is on a roll it's when you have officers and police officers in there, you've got to be on time, you know. You've got to sharpen your shoes, make sure you hair comb properly and everything like that. Right, Leroy? Hey, you all right? Yeah, I'm just saying, I've, I've got to get straight to the point, and I can't beat around when I've got that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Time, time, time is very important. It's <laughs> of the essence. So. <laughs> time is very important of the essence, you know. I, I mean, if, if you were paying me for this, I would say time is money, but you're not. Leroy, you didn't have to say that. Come on, you mess up the whole thing now, man. Everybody think you're going to be... <laughs> this, this, well, is, this is what's known as um, community action, so it's all voluntary. It's all good. Yes, yes. Leroy, how's your Easter been? How's your Easter been? It's been very busy, you know, cause, uh, because of this um, issue around the murder rate in yes. London being greater than New York for the last two months, February and March. Yes. I was doing a bit of radio and a bit of TV. So um, I've been pretty busy, uh, other than going to church and, as you say, bun and cheese and, you know, time with the family. So yeah. it's, been, it's been busy. It's been busy. But it's all trying to highlight the, the plight which we find ourselves and hopefully how we all work to turn these things around. Yeah. Well, um, Leroy, uh, before, before we get into the main one, because uh, I think I, I really want to focus a lot on the, the same New York issue there. Someone said recently on another post saying, I, I think it speaks wonders of New York than of London. The, <laughs> I mean to say the person was belittling London issue to say that <laughs> at least it points that New York has been um, very successful, you know. So, um, so people look at it in different ways. But listen, the Jamaica... Um, Diaspora Crime Intervention and Preventive Task Force. It's one year anniversary of this. Now, many persons on here will hear the word Jamaica Diaspora Crime Init Intervention and Prevention Task Force. Uh, what does that mean and what is it about, um, Leroy? Well, basically, from um, 2016, the, the Jamaica government um, which was relatively new at that time, the Labour government, which is still incumbent, um, decided to mobilize the diaspora across the three main countries of the US, yes. Canada and the UK. And as a result of that, they brought in various areas of work. One was on yes. education, 
on health and then on crime and on the arts. So um, the crime task force is, uh, as I said, um, covers the three main areas and the overall coordinator is Dr. Rupert Francis, who's based in LA. Yeah, he's a, yes, he's a, yeah. he's a ret retired military um, Jamaican Defence Force officer. And he's an academic now. He's, he actually lectures in LA. And he yeah. uh, has gone from the US, Canada, and now the UK to yeah. organise different task force. So we set up the... He, he came over in March of last year, and uh, 2017, and he went to various sites, not only in London, but in Birmingham. And we said, okay, we heard what you're saying. And we said, well, we need to take some steps ourselves. Primarily because the, I think the UK diaspora has a quite a unique role to play in terms of the, um, how can I say, the same legal system. Yeah. the whole jurisprudence piece, it, the Jamaica system is based on ours. So we, we can really feed into their legal system a bit more. Um, over the years, the Met Police has been in direct um, relations with the Jamaican Constabulary Force in terms of technology. Yeah. Uh, I know Op and Tri Operation Trident used to um, do a lot of work with them. And... Uh, They've exchanged officers as well. Uh, it's not as proactive as it used to be because that's been a victim of austerity like every other public um, service. Yeah. So we, we're we building on that, really. And, and my sort of work with the JCF stems back to 2001 through the Black Police Association, through uh, our leadership exchange programs for young people. So it just seemed a natural fit for me to be involved, um, even though it's, it takes more time out, but it, it's to try and help develop safer and more secure Jamaica. Yeah. So that people who live, who visit, who want to return, or even just uh, want to just keep in touch, will feel a sense of belonging and feel they can contribute. And, 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 and in that means, you mean to say that people in the diaspora, um, in the UK, Canada, uh, Rupert is in the United States, you are actually the representative for the UK side, um, Leroy. So That's right. people can somewhat feel some level of um, participation in the process of crime, because crime is a key factor that many persons say they want to go back home to Jamaica and everything like that, but uh, they're worried about the crime. What can they do? So my question is, what can Jamaicans in the diaspora or people of Jamaican ancestry do to sort of support and work what you guys are doing in any respect? Well, I'd like to think that it's not just ancestry. It can be uh, shared and common experience yeah. um, with Jamaican, whatever it may be, maybe through marriage. I, I know my wife, my children, they relate to Jamaica. Um, and even my wife, she's from Nigeria, and she relates to Jamaica. So it's that shared and common experience. She's been to Jamaica several times. So I'd like to think it, it, it's as wide a diaspora as possible. Um, I think in the first instance, everyone can speak positive about Jamaica because yeah. we see so much negative media around it. And some of it is well-founded. Yeah. But I think there are certain instances where there's a lot of stereotyping, a lot of assumptions being made about Jamaica. And, and you know, we, we need to build on the positives. But being realistic, we can't just say it's all sweetness and light. And we know the murder rate it, um, has been very high, you know, and, and it's not just confined to those garrisons and those um, crime hotspots. You know, it has been spinning out into wider areas. Um, and we've seen that in the St. James's area in Montego Bay. And, you know, we got, and that's one of the reasons behind the um, security measures that's been brought in. So I think we can do it in the first instance, talk positive about Jamaica, wherever we can. 
and I try and do that. Uh, I think the other thing is to see what sort of initiative that's already out there. There's various initiatives that try to build um, safer and stronger communities. So I, I know um, the Growth Council is doing a lot of work to build infrastructure and entrepreneurship and various other um, ways in which we can upwardly mobile communities in Jamaica. Because I, I think it's quite clear if you've got a job and you've got a sense of purpose and you believe you can buy into a community, then there's less chance. doesn't mean it's totally eradicated, but there's yeah. less chance of being involved in, um, you know, crime. So those are the sort of initiatives that we are conscious of. But specifically crime, um, we found that we, we've got some beacon projects. And one of the first one is through uh, an organization called Spark to Life. It's uh, an initiative that's been running in East London for a specific amount of time, over 10 years. Yeah. And they, they do a lot of work in prisons over here and also do um, various um, mentoring programs. So they'll mentor inmates in the prisons, say about three months before they get released. And so they have a relationship with the, um, the ex-offender once they're out um, and part of the probation system. So they help to, um, you know, hopefully get that person a job, get various opportunities to change their behavior in the past, their collection of friends, their maybe sometimes even where they actually live, um, just to break that negative cycle. Yeah, yeah. And so that work has been looked at very closely by um, Senator Pernell Charles. Um, however, you may have heard he's just been promoted to the, 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 the Foreign Office. So he might, he, he's going to pass that on to one of his colleagues, one hopes. Um, the other thing he, he, we, we are trying to do is to link in with organizations already in Jamaica. So you, you might not know, but there's an organization called Fight for Peace. Yes. It's actually started in Brazil, of all places, um, by um, an English uh, gentleman who's rolled it out to 27 sites across the world. Yeah. And Jamaica is one of those sites in Kingston. So it's actually headed up in Jamaica by a woman called Kelly Maxson who's doing a great job. So she, they're not only investing in the community, but they're trying to make links to coordinate all the various initiatives, even, even over here. And I think one of the reasons why they're doing it over here is because they have an academy in, in um, Woolwich, okay. in North Woolwich, here in London. So they, they see a very important thing. It's not just about, oh, we just give them to Jamaica because Jamaica's in such a dire situation. I believe that Jamaica can teach us a lot of things. It's not just a one-way process. It's a, got a dual action. Yeah. So that's where uh, Spark to Life and Fight for Peace are trying to get that coordination. And we're hoping that we will go through the procurement process uh, with um, the Jamaican government uh, through the Ministry of National Security. So that's, that's, that's the sort of beacon project we're doing. Uh, the other thing uh, we're doing is um, calling Integrity Club. And that um, initiative has been, um, been running with the National Integrity um, Association over in Jamaica. Is that with Chuck and Monroe? That's the one, yeah. yeah. And he's been um, trying to get that bottom-up approach around bringing back, you know, those key issues that reduces the potential of corruption. Um, we know that's a big issue in, in Jamaica and other countries. It's not unique to Jamaica. Yeah. But obviously, it is something that needs to be eradicated so that people believe that the services they receive is fit for purpose. It's not going to be compromised by nepotism or any other for the vested interests. And hopefully, we'll get uh, the new generation of young people working with ethics and integrity at the heart of what they want to do. Um, and, and finally, the other project we do is the Roving Cares Givers program, 
uh, that's been running uh, in Jamaica for a number of years, over 20 years. Yeah. And um, one of the key people involved in it is uh, Dr. Lola Ramakan, the current High Commissioner's wife. Yeah. And she's actually on the diaspora board, and I'll touch on a few other members of the board in a minute, but she has been running the um, Robin Cares Givers Program. It's an award-winning program, um, even the UN has identified it. So we're trying to get some funding to, to establish it over here. And um, I think main, we're, we're trying to get corporate organizations. So if there's any corporate organizations out there would really like to invest, please uh, let us know. Because what it is, it's support of the child even before yeah. they're actually born. It is about taking care of the mother, making sure those issues that, you know, like domestic violence and various things that can either have an impact on the child before they're born, on the fetus, it, it is reduced. And of course, supporting the family, which is a key part of it, because as you know, they say if you can take care of the family, you will take care of 80% of a community's problems. Okay. You know, the, the, the family is key in all of this. So, you know, that project is um, something that's well established and it's around support in a way that really highlights uh, the, the key components of the village grows up a child. It is not just the nuclear family, okay. um, or the extended family. Okay, good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to thank you so much for joining. I'm with uh, Dr. Leroy Logan, um, former commander of police um, in uh, Scotland Yard, uh, Metropolitan Police in the UK. And also, he's also the representative for the uh, Jamaica Diaspora Crime Intervention and Prevention Task Force. I'd appreciate if you actually just uh, share um, this video, like this video, especially share this video as much as possible. We're going to be speaking about um, knife crime and issues regarding whereby London has somewhat surpassed um, New York in regards to um, crime, especially murders or whatever like that. Leroy will spend some more time on that. And as well on Instagram, if you can join me over at Silburn TV on Silburn, um, as well um, as you're only seeing me, but not seeing Leroy, who is much more handsome than me and much dashing. What can I say? Leroy, yeah, back to you. You mean after all this time I'm not going out there? No one can see me? No, 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 no. On Instagram, I've got a link on Instagram. Oh, Instagram. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, everybody see on Facebook Live, but I've got an Instagram link here to the side as well. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, you're technical, man. You're technical. <laughs> well, I learned, you got, you, we, we've got to do it, Leroy. We've got to do it, you know. We can't wait for others to do it. We've got to do it. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Yes. So you're saying now about um, the Jamaica Diaspora Initiative and the board members and and the whole, whole work of it. Because one of the things um, as well, it is like the, the recent state of emergency in Jamaica, which was in Montego Bay, St. James, and uh, right now I'm working with a guy who is from Salt Spring who is trying to create a, a hub down there in, in Jamaica with some containers. I, I'll speak to people another time about this project. But now it has moved over now to St. Catherine, um, the whole state of emergency. When that happens, and you can deal with it at, at your own time, are you guys um, somewhat advised about it? Do you, uh, is the Jamaican government give you that air? If you say, listen, there's some ideas or so, or you're just a ceremonial um, position, figure. No, no, no. Um, they, it's, it's not, um, how can I say, as systematic as we'd like it to be. Yeah. But uh, we do get briefings from Dr. Rupert Francis, because he goes to Jamaica quite a lot, yeah. to get briefings from the Ministry of National Security in particular. So he will um, disseminate information uh, directly through uh, Dropbox. He also will up update me personally through social media or even through the phone. And also he will make sure that Facebook page, there is a Facebook page for the task force. So if you, again, on, would like to see what's happening, the Jamaican Diaspora Crime Investigation and and investigate intervention and prevention task force. Let me get it right. Yes. We have a, a, a Facebook page. So again, uh, I believe that's the, the process we've developed so far. But also, if, if there's any sort of ministers that come over from Jamaica, they invariably will speak to us personally. 
and the last one was the Attorney General, um, Dr. Marlene Malufort, yeah. and um, she was extremely um, encouraged by our, our work that we're doing to, even if it's to support the work of those projects, but also we're doing more than that, because she was pleasantly surprised that um, one of my board members, um, Arlene Small, who's um, a bar barrister, she does a lot of um, family law in particular. She um, has been doing a real um, in-depth analysis of the, the new security bill. Yes. And how that ties in with these zones of specialist operations where it's very enforcement based. But we even said, and this is where our feedback has been, to ensure that the more support services, the partnership approach is not uh, dismissed because the default position for a lot of security agencies is enforcement. Yeah. It's not partnership and prevention. So we need to encourage them to say, listen, don't forget this piece because that's a key part for sustainability and the buy-in of the community. So we have done a lot of, um, in particular Arlene, Arlene Small, she has done a lot of work around that and um, she um, will be updating us because we've got a board meeting um, on Thursday. Please tell her hello as well, yeah. yeah. Say that again? No, I said please tell her hello. I worked with her before, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll do. And, and, and you know, so that, that um, again, we'll, we feed into um, Dr. Francis because we have a, like a WhatsApp group where Dr. Francis um, monitors what we're doing and, you know, he gets all the information that we circulate um, through WhatsApp and through emails. So you'll know what we're doing. Because as I said before, the whole jurisprudence legal system is UK based in, in essence. So uh, I think we've got a, a quite a unique perspective that needs to be um, accepted and acknowledged at least. It's something like this um, around the Caribbean countries. Someone just said, uh, not just for Jamaica, but other Caribbean islands. Is it something uh, with other Caribbean islands as well, um, Leroy? Um, well, I know a lot of Caribbean islands, like, like many um, Commonwealth countries, they have a diaspora of one form or another. Uh, I, I know that um, because of the physical size of, the, of Jamaica in the Caribbean, we are seen as the, the big brother and sister yes. in, in terms of numbers. Because um, as you know, there's more people living off the island of, you know, the island population is 3 million, but there's more yes. Jamaican diaspora off the island yeah. um, in excess of that 3 million. So, you know, we, 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 I think we punch above our weight. And then we do have, um, you know, a lot of, a um, bit of a head start in terms of sports, you know, when you've got iconic um, people like, um, what's his name? What a sprinter near. You say both. <laughs> oh, that's oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, I'm the side of mine. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. Here we go, I just um, see that. Jenna Dance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jenna Bounce, so, sorry. Yeah. What, so when you got iconic people like that uh, in, in in music, um when you're Bob oh yeah, Bob Martin, I'll let people. Yeah. And it doesn't matter where you go in Jamaica in the world, yeah. everyone knows you you're a Jamaican. So when you've got that it gives us a bit, certain amount of kudos and a certain amount of understanding that we got. We might be small, we're little, but we're Talawa, yeah. and we're able to, you know, present ourselves well, you know, because I, I truly believe there's nothing um, bad about Jamaica that can't be sold by what's good in it. Yeah. So we need to recognize the importance of that and utilize as many opportunities as we can to really make um, Jamaica. Um, even greater, yes. you know, because um, it is a, it's got a, so many uh, attributes and we just need to be positive about that. And that's why I think everyone, regardless of what your persuasion is, politically, um, whatever parish you're from, you know, whether you were born over here like me, but you went to school out there, whatever your, 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 your disposition is, you can always big up Jamaica if you're of that mindset to focus on the positive. Right not the negative and and in in last on this particular point as we go on to the next um half an hour um what, what are the board members uh comprised of for the uh the initiative um leroy 
Yeah, right. Well, my um, my deputy coordinator, so I'm, I'm the UK coordinator, my deputy coordinator is um, Orville Dorman. Uh, he's um, one of, you must know Orville, he's ex uh, Jamaican constab uh, sorry, Defense Force, and also he works, he used to work for the High Commission. Um, also, he's with the, the various Jamaican defense associations, JESA, etc. Um, so he's my deputy. Then we have um, Fitzroy Grant. Uh, Fitzroy is a, a member of the, the wider diaspora um, association that's been running for best part of 15 years. Yeah, because I remember I was, to the first was one of the diaspora. first persons on that thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how we, yeah, yeah, we, we, we uh, connected through that as well. So um, that's been running, um, still running, and, and in fact, they had their AGM last weekend which i wanted to attend but unfortunately through some personal family challenges i wasn't able to attend um but we're hoping to go to their uh, annual annual conference um in june yes so we're, we're looking forward to that because we need to sort of build on that and fitzroy is that liaison person yes um as i said dr lola ramakan uh the high commissioner's um wife yes and as i said i worked with the roving cares givers program uh, I've already touched on Arlene Small, who's doing some excellent work around the security crime bill and really doing some in-depth analysis about that. Um, we've got what is known as three Ps. Um, we've got Paul Chambers, he's ex-Jamaican um, uh, Defence Force yeah. captain, um, and he's running the Integrity Club. Mm. Uh, and we also got um, Paul Charlton, he's a, an ex-Met officer and um, he went to Jamaica and was doing some work with Indicom. Yes. As you know, they've been doing a lot of um, investigative work um, around uh, police action in certain cases who were very questionable. And then the third P is a guy called Paul Riddell. Uh, he's ex-CRE. You remember the Commission for Racial Equality? Yeah. yeah. And, um, he is um, retired now, but he still does a lot of work as a consultant around equality yes. and, and justice issues. So uh, we're really pleased that he's involved. Uh, there's also a, uh, a young man called uh, Pastor Audie Cummings. Um, oh, yeah. He is uh, quite an entrepreneur when it comes to barbering and barber shops. One of and... my one of my secret advisors. <laughs> yes, I heard. I heard. I, 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 sometimes I, I I kept some of his um, on live stuff as well. So. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's good. It's good to see we're all one big happy family. You know, you know, Leroy, it's glad you say that. You know, and there's a massive connection which is taking place within the the black community where people are now actually recognizing the value of each other. You know, and utilizing that. You know, just like what you're doing, we're giving our time. I'm actually you creating my space, the platform to to showcase what we all are doing. So, yeah, great one. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's it's really important that we start to, uh, you know, get away from this silo mentality of working yes. and sometimes against each other and prevent this deep confliction and start to, you know, um, realize that there's so much work we need to do. Mm. And um, it is enough for everyone to work, hopefully, in a coordinated fashion because there's no lack of creativity. Yes. It's a coordination is the issue. So um, I, I'm, I'm hoping um, that that will continue. I think social media and various other uh, communication platforms will help us to really um, give that, uh, develop a critical mass of people who similar thinking, um, you know, common interests. So if the Jamaica um, diaspora is something that we can really hang our coat on that rack, yeah. then let's do it. You know, let, let, let's not um, say, well, you know, our personal interest is always going to be the forefront. I, I think sometimes we have to think of what we can do for our country. Uh, I'm not saying just Jamaica, but also a bit here in the UK. You know, it, it's the whole Kennedy thing, you know. Uh, it's not what you your country can do for you, what is you what you can do for your country. Yeah. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for that, Leroy. Ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for joining up with Leroy Logan, Dr. Leroy Logan, um, superintendent, former superintendent of police um, with Metropolitan Police and uh, 
we're going to go to the next level. Now, we just spoke about the Jamaica Diaspora um, Crime Initiative Program. And um, I put the details there, Leroy, um, on it so people can actually go to this, the, the Facebook page. Uh, I posted Brilliant. that so they can go and join up to that page. And Dr. Rupert Francis, who has been on this program before, um, will also welcome persons. Now, Leroy, um, I was reading today, and we spoke about this last night, London's murder rate has overtaken New York City's for the first time ever, according to a news report. February marked the first month the UK capital saw more murders than New York, with 15 dead, nine age, nine of them aged 30 or younger. According to the report in the Sunday Times, London has also suffered 22 fatal stabbings and shootings in March, higher than the 21 in the Big Apple. Both cities have similar sized populations of around 8.5 million people. New York City murder rate has decreased by around 87% since the 1990s. What's going on with London, Leroy? I mean, what's going on? Well, um, it, I'm amazed how bad it is. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that just to be negative. I, I'm absolutely amazed because knife crime, gun crime has had its peaks in the past. Um, I remember the sort of late 90s, uh, there, there was a massive peak in, in knife and gun crime aligned with crack cocaine supply because when uh, crack cocaine was um, transported to Europe, this country got absolutely swamped with it. So you saw a peak of that. But I think what was the really important issue, we had public services that were a lot more proactive Yes, were a lot more resilient and they were more in touch with the community than they have been um, for years. And we built on that. And then obviously um, we had Operation Trident that was, but it was community driven. Yes. You know, communities really worked with the police. And I remember I used to be on the Trident Independent Advisors Group and, you know, there was a lot of... Um, sustainability in funding to make sure that the police was accountable and more um, challenged by communities. Yes. And that had a significant impact on um, gun crime in particular and all of the gang feuds, etc. Now, it wasn't totally eradicated, but also we were able to be bringing preventative programs. So we had, I remember when I was at Hackney, in the early O's, um, early to mid O's, I was able to invest in local community programs. So that would build trust and confidence. We work in partnership with the community, especially those organizations that, you know, were doing some great stuff. Um, you know, like the crib. The crib has been running in Hackney for almost 20 years. And, you know, because those local community people have a heart for their community, they desire to see change and they're going to stick at it and and I could give you countless others like that so you know we had that um, relationship it wasn't perfect but it's much better than it is now and then we developed the safer neighborhood teams where each ward across the country would have a sergeant two constables and um, three police community safety officers now those officers were well I remember um, Hackney was one of the first boroughs to have safe and over teams at all of its wards. All, all of my 32 wards had officers selected and they were reflective of the community and then that cultural intelligence, that cultural understanding. So even if something went wrong, a stabbing, a shooting, police heavy handed um, activity, we had those community action groups we had regular meetings with the community. And because there was those constant um, developments, you know, those constant meetings, dialogue, we were able to get an understanding of where the community, uh, how they perceived us, how we could do better, and more importantly, the intelligence to really act on crime and violence. But, and yeah. and as, as a result of that, we, we saw an increase in trust and confidence. Now, those safer neighbor teams have been decimated. Mm. You know, they're not ring fenced to one ward. 
they may have a cluster of wards. They get um, they have to do investigations, and um, because there's such a, a hemorrhage of detectives in the Met, less than more than 700 detectives have left the Met over the last few years um, because of austerity, because people have had enough, uh, their morale is low, their high caseload has caused them to feel demoralized. I even got a tweet, and I'll end with this. I got a tweet. Uh, I, I sent a tweet out around the, 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 the number of murders in, in London, <laughs> only during the week before this um, link with New York. And I said, is, is this really... Um, justifiable? Is it, you know, can we put up with this? You know, is it, is it just me, but is this totally unacceptable? Something like that. And um, this homicide officer will remain nameless, um, but you can check my Twitter feed and you'll see his details. And he, uh, oh yes, Leroy Logan triple nine. Yes. At Leroy Logan triple nine. So you can see I'm still institutionalized with triple nine on my yeah. Twitter feed, but anyway. Um, and he actually said, I, he's got one week to go before he leaves the Met, and he's already really concerned about the plight and morale of investigators because the, the caseload is so high, they're overworked, morale is low, they're being underfunded, you know, they feel devalued, they don't feel valued. And if, if a workforce doesn't feel valued, you will get more instances where members of the community are saying, well, officers, are unprofessional, they don't treat me with respect and dignity. So it's a perfect storm. You know, there's an inextricable link. If you treat your staff right, you're better uh, equipped to serve the needs of a, of a community. Right. Okay. And that is one of the issues we're suffering from now. All right, Lou, I, I want to pull back because uh, where you went into there is the relationship with the police and the community and the resources which they have in their hands. Um, someone mm -hmm. just said here on Twitter, on, on Instagram, the mayor's office and powers that be know exactly who they need to be engaging with to solve this issue. They deliberately and systematically ignore community experts. I want to talk about, um, then you said the, the knife crime was at a peak and, and it just felt like it was going down, but it has increased. Now, the, the, the police coming on board and the engaging with safer neighborhood, isn't that dealing with the symptoms, Leroy? No, no, um, but forgive me if I didn't Sorry. emphasize that we had investing in communities to do prevention work. Yeah. Prevention, problem solving. Um, you know, that, that for us was the, the, one of the key things to enhancing our proactivity. So we weren't just reacting to one crisis or another. We were engaged with the community. We were able to get proper intelligence information because we were working with the community a lot more. We had the infrastructure to do that. We could invest in local communities who were doing preventative work. So, you know, it, it, it was for me a lot more coordinated. It was a lot more, um, I, I would like to think, sustainable mm. um, in its approach. And that for me has been lost. Um, you know, the, the, those funding arrangements that uh, I had as the deputy borough commander my upset numbers now don't have that at all. You know, the, the, they would like to, but austerity has had a massive impact. I, um, on that. Yeah. Is, is, is that in regards to um, ways of sort of uh, having community programs for, for young people? Yeah. Okay. I mean, to be quite honest, the, the, the Voyage program I, I've been running um, for the last 17 years. Uh, Voice of the Youth and Genuine Empowerment. That's a BTEC Level 2 educational mm. program in response to knife crime. And it involves a, a leadership program where uh, we take them on a residential. And in fact, the residential starts next week uh, for this cohort. And we take them to a, um, one of these um, more adventure, outward bound mm. activity um, area in Kent. And I, I know members of the Black Police Association I've been volunteers on that. And I can see June Durrant, one of our active members of the, the BPA, um, you know, she, she's been um, given um, her time on these issues. So, and then she does that for other organizations. So we, we, we had that program specifically for, mm. you know, um, working with young people. Now, 
That used to be funded by the Met, but the Met had to pull back and then the mayor took over and the mayor's pulled back. So that program, if we didn't have the real dogged and determination, we wouldn't be able to keep that going um, all the years we have because, you know, we would have just been another victim of, of, of austerity, but we determined to keep it going. And fortunately, and by a lot of hard work, we are still there. So that's just an example of where things um, could have gone horribly wrong. But there's a lot of organizations, small, medium enterprises have fallen foul of austerity. And there is, it, it's actually eroded the infrastructure of community preventative programs yeah. that used to be out there that could help working with public services. You see, I'm, I'm, looking, at, I'm looking at this in, a, in another way as well, Leroy, and um, I hear what you're saying, and I'm looking, I want to go a bit back and go back into these young people here. Um, who are the perpetrators? Who are the ones who are doing the stabbing and the killing? And are we in agreement that it is predominantly in the black community? Yes? I'm a great believer of crime has no color. Crime is crime. Yeah. However, yeah. there are certain prerequisites that leads to crime, you know, um, deprivation, social exclusions. Yes. Um, not taking advantage of education because of all sorts of reasons, not just in the home, but peer pressure, etc. Lack of job opportunities, etc. So these things, you know, and now we know social media, music, videos, the whole nine yards can impact on how young people get groomed into certain lifestyles. So we, you need to, re I'm sure you recognize that um, over 70% of the black community is um, corralled in these deprived communities. And they're hardened areas where unfortunately got bl blighted by crack cocaine. Um, and as a result of that, this so-called war on drugs. Uh, but now it's medication drugs and it's more, mainly white people involved in it. It is supportive. Mm. But you know, when it's crack cocaine, it was a war on drugs. And, and black people, unfortunately, a lot of black people got criminalized in that. Some of it justified, but unfortunately, there's a lot that wasn't justified. So, you know, because of those prerequisite can lead to certain types of crime and black communities have been corralled in these areas. Yes, there is that manifestation of crime appearing to be black. But if you go into Leeds, you go into Glasgow, where they recently reduced knife crime by 40% through that coordinated approach I'm talking mm -hmm. about, most of the per perpetrators are white. Mm -hmm. So, that, you know, how it's played out on a regular basis, um, that it's a black crime. It's, crime is not crime. There are certain yeah. factors that lead to it. So. We need to recognize that and stop making assumptions about that and understand that there needs to be um, a real shift from the enforcement approach that we, we're suffering from. And I can safely say you can't arrest yourself out of this problem. You can't stop and search yourself out of that problem. You can't taser people out of this problem. Yeah. You need to work closely with the community and I, I'm advocating um, a public health approach, recognizing that violence is like a virus. Is it, it's like an epidemic at the moment, yeah. where you, you, you need to um, understand that a lot of people are traumatized, you know, especially our young people. Um, and you know, I, I had a friend, someone who worked with me in the diaspora, uh, when I went to the diaspora conference in July, and he called me, because I haven't got his permission to mention his name, but he called me two weeks ago that his son was leaving the tube station where he left his car, mm -hmm. and he got challenged to know which part of London he lives, because he didn't live in the area where he left his car, which is yeah. not far from where I live, here in East London. They stabbed him. 18-year-old guy, just left work. He was in his sports gear. And... Fortunately, because he's a fit young man, he got through intensive care in the London and he was able to um, withstand 
multiple operations mm. and all the um, various procedures. Um, and, you know, I've been liaising with his father. And as a result of that, he's now out of intensive care, but he's lost a section of his bum. Mm. And, you know, he has to go through all of that trauma. And there's a lot of youngsters, not only, you know, near misses, near death experiences like that, yeah. but there are those who've um, had been run down and haven't been caught, have to leave where they live, you know, because if they can't get you, they get their family or friends. Um, you know, they're, they're traumatized by what they see on social media. So it's all those sort of things. We need to recognize what violence is all about. Violence 10 years ago, yeah. and I used to deal with it as an investigator, is not what it is today. Yeah. So um, I'm doing a piece of work with a Youth Violence Commission, uh, youth, youthviolencecommission.com. Uh, it's, it's on my, my Twitter feed as well, where uh, a Vicky Foxcrot M MP is, doing a, is heading up the, the other MP commissioners, uh, which includes Chuko Muna and uh, James Cleverly. So it's an all party commission. And we're actually doing evidence sessions at um, Port Cullis House with various key people looking at violence from a different perspective, from, uh, from a housing, from an educational, from um, a faith based. In fact, we had um, SPAC Nation um, there um, on Monday. We also had um, the Oasis Trust with Steve Chalk. Um, um, so, you know, I'm Ben uh, Lindsay from Lewisham. You know, people are doing stuff. Um, and we're also doing a definitive um, survey that's um, we, we, we're doing in partnership with Warwick University, really looking at what violence is all about. And it's been a facilitated um, questionnaire, not just something online. Because when you start in asking people about why trauma is an issue for you, why violence has hit you, how it's hit yeah, you, yes. how it's impacted on you, you need to facilitate this so you know you don't bring out even worse um, adverse effects on that individual. So that piece of work is ongoing, and we um, have a report coming out in the autumn to feed into all of the parties, um, party conferences, and we're hoping to do fringe meetings at all the party um, work. And we got a specific emphasis in London through a, a board that I chair called the London Independent Youth Safety Advisory Board that works for the commission. And uh, we're doing some pilot work around this public health approach uh, to violence. And in fact, Lambeth is one of our key boroughs that's doing some excellent work. And, um, you know, we've got organizations that normally wouldn't even work together, you know, working with the independent advisors group um, headed up by a chap called Nick Mason. Yeah. But we've got Lee Jasper who's working with Code 7. We've got um, Gary Trousdale from the Spirit of London Awards um, and, and all of the Damalola Taylor work he's done. So, you know, we've got people working together who normally wouldn't work together. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can get that model, which is very similar to what they did in Glasgow with a violence reduction unit, I truly believe we can get a, a, a more um, sustainable people power type approach and not just relying yeah. on politicians or the police. All right, stick up in um, we need to ever... Go on. Yeah, stick up in on that point. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I've got Leroy Logan. We're talking about um, that London has um, gone past New York um, City as the murder capital. You know, I wouldn't say the murder capital of the world, but uh, uh, um, it has surpassed in New York. Um, Leroy, uh, I want to sort of, um, you mentioned something there a while ago about the different organizations, right? And there are lots of different organizations which are doing things. Uh, Liwa, I, I, think, I think the reality of the whole thing is that there is a fundamental problem whereby the crime is increasing. And uh, from the period that you are there, you have seen how you are arresting it or, or, or dealing with it. But then with the advent of social media, which has increased, that the Commission of Police recently said, Chrissy the Dick, that social media has actually helped to stimulate stabbings or knife crime. Um, what is the, the different organizations that you're talking about coming together, working together to deal with this epidemic? Working together. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I actually um, I acknowledge what the commissioner has said, 
However, I don't think our analysis as in depth as it should be, but our survey is sort of um, accepting and, and, and repeating those similar findings, yeah. um, but not just in London, but nationally. Yeah. It's a national survey. Now, what I think when you, when you get the analysis done properly, and if you really got a, 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 a strong network of, of organizations, I truly believe you start to coordinate um, organizations in a lot more structured and sustainable way. And also it helps the police to go to these social media platforms and say, what are you doing about violent incidents that are put on your platform? Um, negative music, um, how um, feuds are being um, instigated through yeah. um, social media. So it's all those sort of things it does. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I believe uh, London Independent Youth Safety Advisory Board is getting a handle on um, to support the police to really get the intelligence and evidence to say this is what's happening. And hopefully it will make sure that they're a lot more um, structured in how they work with the community mm -hmm. so that, you know, communities feel that they're working with a police service and not an occupying force. Um, they, they don't believe that they're over police and underprotected, especially young people, you know. Um, so, you know, we, we need to understand more um, in depth the, the, what social media is penetrating because we know that peer pressure is increasing through social media. You know, even up to 10 years ago, um, peer pressure wasn't as advanced as it is now because social media was not as comprehensive. And that's one of the things we need to really analyze. How is it having an impact? You know, we know it, there is certain outcomes, but what is the impact on the, on, on the real scale of things? Where is the most susceptible ages yes. in these things? So that, that I, I truly believe that we're still at the early stages. And, and to say we've got a definitive answer on that, I, I, I don't, I, I'd be unwise to say that. But I think in the recognition should start to get, I would like to think central government a lot wiser because they've just um, published their, their violence strategy, which is no, it's, it's not earth shattering at all. Um, it's not making a big thing about social media as it should. But the important thing is they're starting to have that conversation. Now, talk is cheap. We've, we've got to start putting um, their money where their mouth is, as it were, and start working with communities who actually can evidence what they do and, and not just talk a good job. I've, I've seen like um, organizations like um, Dina Call with Road CEO. Um, we're speaking to them today about uh, 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 if, you, if you know about that particular project. Uh, road CEO with C, uh, Dina Carr. I don't know if you know about that project. I mean, there's so many of them which are rising. Leroy? Uh, I must admit, I haven't heard of that one, but, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, um, especially when it comes to the rollout of our report, uh, I would really like to start getting a real strong network of organizations that yeah. hopefully are able, able to um, take, oh, sorry, my doorbell keeps on ringing. <laughs> hopefully someone's answering it. Um, yeah, they see you online think, and listen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more than likely it's my son because he's got his friends in and out of this place. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I would like to think that organizations like that um, will tap into the Youth Violence Commission website because there is a, a platform to, to log in and, 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 reckon, and fill out what they do because it's being coordinated at the House of Commons through um, Vicky Foxcroft's uh, MPs PA. So, you know, I, I think for the first time, we're we really starting to get, um, you know, a real um, a, a paradigm shift. We're, we're doing things differently. Yeah. Um, because if, if we do the same things and expect different results, uh, as Einstein said, that's madness. So we've got to do things differently oh. and in a sustainable way. Okay, listen to what this person says. In regards to London, we may have to think about the unthinkable the reintroduction of random stop and search in urban areas 
minimum five years imprisonment for carrying a knife or acid without good reason public. There's a great need to go down harder on knife and acid carriers. What's your thoughts on, on that? Um, no, listen, I, I'm a great believer of enforcement, done intelligence-led enforcement, and not um, random fishing expeditions. Because, you know, stop and search. You know, one, one of the most things it picks up is drugs, not knives. Mm. When um, even the home office analysis proves the police um, suggestion is wrong, that when they go, actually go to search people for knives and other um, obnoxious devices, pointed blades, etc., they, they, they don't find those things. It's less than 5% they actually find through direct intelligence saying. So at the moment, it's very random uh, and, and it's not because they're not getting the intelligence. So I'm a great believer, intelligence led, very, very structured um, stop and search. Yeah. That's not, um, you know, bothering people who are going about the lawful business, right. not harassing people unduly and, and only harassing the ones that are carrying the nines. But you need to know who they are. And you've got to work with the community to tell you who they are. I'm glad you and if you don't, that, especially yeah. young people, they know who's carrying their knives in them yeah. and where they store it and where they can get hold of it and et cetera, I'm or glad, their guns, yeah. et cetera. You, and until you can get to that stage, then, I'm, I, you know, you, you've got to use those sort of powers wisely. Yeah. And I don't believe it's being used as wisely as it used to be because we would get having a bigger impact. I'm, if Stop and yeah. Search was the answer, it, there would have been a bigger impact on it a long time ago. I'm glad you said what you said because someone just said on Instagram, uh, take on board what you are saying, but the relationship between the community and police is totally broken. Check the actual stats regarding stop and search needs to be intelligence led, which is what you're saying there. So therefore, it seemed very much that the, the community and the police, the relationship is not at a high level and therefore they need that intelligence. Well, it, it's, it's clear, you know, through the years. I mean, the time when trust and confidence was at its highest was soon after the Lawrence Inquiry, when, you know, you had central government um, coordination. You had political leadership through the Labour government at that stage, really holding chief constables to account. I myself, as the National Black Police Association chair, went to a conference working with Jack Straw and Paul Boateng, his deputy at the time, really looking at stop and search and other um, powers yeah. and saying, publish these figures. And if you don't do these figures properly, we will take it away from you. Yeah. And remember, even Theresa May was threatening that quite recently when she was Home Secretary. Yes. You know, but there doesn't seem to be the same sort of emphasis with Amber Rudd or even, you know, Theresa May as the Prime Minister. All of a sudden, <clears throat> holding back. Um, but you need political will to make these things happen. You really need chief constables to be held to account. You know, when I was um, in Hackney, my borough used to get all sorts of phone calls about knife crime, gun crime, burglaries, street mm. crime, robberies, whatever. But I never used to get a phone call saying, why is your trust and confidence levels low? Why is it you've got so many um, complaints about with officers carrying out the stop and search powers heavy handedly. Yes. <clears throat> you know, those sort of softer issues that erode trust and confidence should be a key issue uh, as it was post Lawrence. So, in a lot of ways, I feel we're in a pre Lawrence era. Mm -hmm. be before the Lawrence inquiry in the mid 90s, we've we, we now come 20 years later into a pre Lawrence era where trust and confidence is bad as it was 20 years ago, where you see people um, feeling over police and underprotected like 20 years ago. Yeah. They feel that they can't work with police. And, 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 mm. and for me, senior officers in the police have to come out that denial. You know, they, they I remember, I, I'll end with this. Yeah. Martin Hewitt, who was the Assistant Commissioner for Territorial Operations, um, was told that the Home Office figures does not time with his around stop and search. 
that it doesn't give you a reduction in knife crime. And if you stop, stop and search, knife crime goes up. And he said, well, no, we'll continue stop and search and, and, and deal with the, the community tensions until such time we get the answers we want. Now, I think that's absolutely, well, it, it, it's unprofessional. Mm. It, it, it's lunacy. Because if you think you're going to deal with community tensions, trust me or not, all you're going to do is throw people into the hands of the street thugs who can groom them into thinking it's wise to carry a knife and you're twice the, the, the person carrying a gun and all these sort of things. And you've got to be a lot more organized and scientific in how you deal with these things. You can't just, you know, as I said, arrest your way out of the problem. Mm. Somebody asked a question, how do we quantify that trust is low? How do we quantify that trust? Uh, could... There's all sorts of things. The public attitude surveys, mm -hmm. um, they're done on a regular basis. Um, they, they're now starting to do that on social media. Um, you can also go onto the Met Police website um, to register. It also takes into account the number of complaints uh, that are done. I don't know if you know, but if someone complains online through the Independent Office for Police Conduct, uh, IOPC as it's now called, it used to be the Independent Police Complaints Commission, IPCC. But if you go to the IOPC website and register your complaint there, that goes on the commissioner's desk. And before you know it, within days, not weeks, within days, it goes on to the borough commander in charge of that officer. Yes. So, and then I remember, and this is even before social media, when people complained through the IPCC as it used to be, I would get, a, a, and especially if that officer had been complained about three times, I would be able to call that officer in, say to them, you, uh, you've been complained about by the way you're dealing with members of the public who happen to be black, whereas other members of your team are not doing, uh, having that sort of outcome. Yeah. Also, I'm gonna put you on the development plan. I'm gonna make sure that if you don't carry on if, if you carry on in the way that you are, um, you will be sanctioned. And, if, and the ultimate sanction is to be sacked. Now, when you start affecting people's money in their pocket, all of a sudden they rise up. Yeah. And it's not a popularity thing. And a lot of uh, supervisors and leaders should need to be supervisors. You know, they, they're, they're not supervisors just to be, oh, Mr. Nice Guy and pull a salary. You need to be sometimes unpopular to hold your officers to account. And it means people in, in, who was in my position as a superintendent getting out their office and you know, seeing what their officers are doing on a regular basis. Now with body cameras, I would like to think that is reducing that sort of policing, but and it also accounts, um, gets the public to account for their actions as well. So it, I would like to think it's a dual pro process. And I'm, I'm worried about this issue about officers turning off their body cameras at a very important time. Yeah. Um, but I would like to think that will Im improve yeah. with time. But there's, so there's various sources of developing um, data around trust and confidence. Okay, Leroy, in wrapping up in the five minutes, uh, what would you say are maybe five, are the five key uh, answers to create the solution or five measures that can create a, a, a solution to bring down this epidemic. But before we do that, one thing we didn't mention about is the home, the parents, the family from early days, because we're talking about young people, young children. What about the family? By the way, may I ask you this question? And I always ask this question. Uh, whenever we hear about knife crime, what we hear about a lot is the uh, victims, the families of the victims. Is there any sort of work which is done with the, the families of the perpetrator after they've been convicted or whatever I like to say? Do you know when you saw something or you saw a signal whereby maybe you overlooked? I mean, you know, there's always the, perpet the, the victim, but with the perpetrator, the family. Well, I, I, I had um, that question put to one of the speakers at our evidence session for the Youth Violence Commission. And she actually does work with perpetrators. And I totally agree, it's been overlooked for years. Um, there is quite rightly a focus on the victim, but I, for us to really understand the causes of crime 
and, and, and building up on that um, understanding, we need to go to perpetrators. That's why this um, survey on violence is going to the perpetrators and speaking to them and say, why did this happen? What built up to that? Someone doesn't just carry a knife and a gun yeah. overnight for nothing. Something's built to that. Maybe it's fear. I remember that a survey that the Met did, oh, about four, maybe longer, eight years ago. It wasn't very scientific how they did it, but it highlighted that fear was the most critical factor for someone carrying a knife. Mm. And, you know, and people can easily get groomed into that, you know, um, and if police are not seen to be um, proactive, not seen to be supporting people and assisting them to feel more secure, then they will easily fall into the hands of those grooming them into using a, a, a knife or, or a gun. So, you know, that sort of thing. But just, just to t talk about um, the, the perpetrators, again, the, the reports will be coming out with that sort of um, emphasis, especially through the evidence sessions and the, the survey. So please, we have not missed that, even though it has been missed for years. Yes. Um, so again, look at the Youth Violence Commission website. Um, just going back to the home, I did touch on it through the Jamaica task force work, you know, about, you know, if you can deal with a home, you can deal with almost 80% of yes. communities issues. Um, we used to have that through various public services, um, you know, um, through um, Home Start and various other things that's been cut. And so you don't have that sort of um, authority to go into families now because you're not supporting them. If you're supporting them financially, then you can have a bit more of an authority to go and say, well, listen, we expect this from you because, you know, we are helping to fund, to assist you as a family. But if Sure yeah. Start gets cut, then there's no, it's reduced access. And that's one of the biggest issues. Um, I, re I really believe that it's been left um, to just high intensity um, risk management for high risk families. That's more or less what they're looking at. And they're, they're just mainly the problem families. But when it comes to those families on the margins that could be helped at, at early intervention, you've got less of that now. That, that's austerity. And, and that's, that's why I beg his belief that central government has disseminated and run public services down into the ground yes. totally to the extent that they, even if they wanted the resilience to work on these things, they haven't got it. But what throws me totally, when they want to get 40 billion for the divorce proceeding for Brexit, uh, or pay 1.2 billion to the um, the DUP Irish Party um, to keep them online so they can stay in government, and or at the moment it, it's costing the government two billion pounds to re-employ or recruit new staff to just deal with Brexit. Yes. So it's amazing how money's no object, but when it comes to dealing with services that used to help the family and other public services, you know, even local authorities and youth services, police, health, education, all of a sudden money is a big issue. And that's, that's for me is something that really needs to be dealt with. It seems like they're getting the message finally. My point is when you cut down to the marrow, not just the bone, but to the marrow, how long will it take to get back to where it was before? Even if you wanted to recruit um, 10,000 officers, because, you know, they're, 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 there's all, all, for the first time, the Met is under 30,000 officers, not to mention the police staff members that's been um, fired. Mm -hmm. So you're talking almost 10,000 members of staff, police and civil service, um, you know, civil staff who have lost the organization. Even if you wanted to, if you had the money overnight to recruit them, to, to, to select them, it's going to take years. Right. And that, that's the issue. And even if you want to develop programs like the public health approach, you need to build back those assets to make it work. Yeah. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. So therefore, Leroy, the way forward then, um, um, 
other than I, I have one way forward. And Leroy, I, I, I've got to put it to you this. Somebody, two persons have said this. Um, you need to get into politics, Leroy. Me? <laughs> no, 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 I'm serious. No, no, Leroy, no. no. The only way I go into politics, I'll tell you straight, the only way I go into politics, I cannot be aligned to a party. I must admit, I'm a member of the Labour Party. Since I joined the police, I've joined the Labour Party because I'm not allowed to be a party member as a police officer. Mm -hmm. But in all honesty, I am so concerned about party politics um, that, I, and I'm, I'm talking about watching them operate behind closed doors. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, politicians remind me of police. And I can't deal with those sort of things. You feel like you're nothing. in bondage. You feel like you're, you're struggling. Yeah, I, I, I would feel shackled. And, and, and even, though I was in, when I, even when I was in the police service, I used to name and shame if need be. I would expose those issues. I did it for, at Lawrence um, in 1998, 20 years ago. So for me to go back into um, politics uh, and, and condone stuff, no, that was the backward step. Personally, I, I would do it as an independent. Well, Dwayne, um, Dwayne Brooks, Dwayne Brooks um, was Stephen Lawrence. He's going independent for Lewisham to run for the mayor of Lewisham. So you got some right. independents are, are stepping up. Um, different groups are talking about that the throwing um, finances behind individuals uh, as well. So it is something we've got to look at down the road, do you want, if anything, you know? Well, I mean, it, 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 to be quite honest, I'm always open to uh, an option. I'm, you know, I've got the desire to make changes for the better. Um, listen, I could be in a nice little, little, nice little home in Montego Bay, just chilling. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't have to do this stuff. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it, it pains my heart when I hear about someone being stabbed or shot, whether they, they're killed or, or, or life-changing injuries or even a near miss. It, it hurts me. Um, and, and, and I can't just sit back and, and watch that, even from afar, you know, because I've got children over here. I've got grandchildren. Um, so whatever I can do, I, I will try my best. Um, until such time... I believe I've got nothing else to add. You know, um, I've I, I passed my sell-by date. Until that such time, I'll, I will do it to the best of my ability. If it involves an independent political campaign, I'm, I'm open to that. If there's anyone out there who wants to have a conversation with that, message me or tweet me, or whatever. Because, you know, I believe we're in drastic times. It needs drastic measures. Fantastic. It needs a paradigm shift. Fantastic. It needs unique and I would like to think cultural intelligence on how you deal with a lot of these issues. So Leroy, in, in, in wrapping up now, what would you say then, uh, okay, was the, the, the key advice that you say to persons who are listening here, uh, persons who are families, persons who are fearful of their children. I mean, I've got a son, which I'm going to be sending to um, a secondary school soon. I, we've got to start to think about him walking by himself, you know what I'm saying, Leroy? You're going to have people thinking like that. You're going to have persons who worry about their son going to a party tonight or so. What, what, what do yeah. they, what advice, what is, what sort of hope do they have or they, they can have from your perspective in wrapping up, Leroy? Well, you know, you, you don't want to scare people, but you need yeah. to make sure your children are aware of what's going on, choosing their friends wisely. You know, I know too many youngsters come from good homes. I've been groomed by the haters out there on the streets just to show that they can drag a young person down to uh, not achieve their true potential. Um, so, you know, as a parent, I am always on my children's um, case. You know, they said, Dad, why are you always giving us a hard time? I said, listen, who's gonna give you a, who else is going to give you a hard time? You're not, you're not really going to get a hard time from teachers because teachers, their hands are tied in a lot of ways. Um, and I always tell them, when they walk over that, um, that barrier called the front door behind me here, yeah. I, listen, that's when you, you walk into Jamaica. So it might be England out there, <laughs> but when you walk past that barrier, all of a sudden, the values of Jamaica is, you know, I'm not saying um, spare the rod and spoil the child, but I'm, I'm saying you need to be held to account. So I think the home is a critical part of it. And, you know, it, it, even, um, I know 
single parents, whether they're male or female, but it's predominantly female, they do brilliant jobs. But we need to support them as best we can, you know. Um, and, and it's not just, I'm all right. You know, I, as I said, I know a lot of families who've done a great job growing up their children, and those children have been groomed into all sorts of madness. Yeah. Street crime, drug dealing, weapons being used for all sorts of crime. So we really need to deal with the home, supporting families. Don't just think, oh, I'm all right, Jack. What's in it for me? Because I'm a great believer that if you think it's going to be sticking in one certain, air, certain types of areas, you're fooling yourself. These things are spilling out. They're going into suburbia. They're going into the shires. You know, so it's, it's not um, contained. It's an epidemic. So we need to be a lot more proactive. Yeah. Um, I think you also have to be involved in your communities. You know, get, you need to be school governors. Um, I was a school governor for years. Um, you need to be working with um, the, uh, the police, whether it's independent advisors, um, custody office visitors, you know, even being a magistrate. Uh, I'm glad to see the diversity in magistrates increasing. So, you know, because um, our community are the ones that's being blighted uh, by this, we, it, there is greater responsibility. Yeah. And I think that's why I've gone to retirement. Um, and, you know, since I retired, I, I used to play a lot of golf. I've been retired five years. I've had three golf games, three. My mate down the road can't believe it. You know, I just don't have the time because I, I want to see those body bags stopped. Yeah. I don't want to see any more youngsters fighting for their life in ICU, in the various trauma hospitals. I want to see young people achieve their true potential and not um, resort to violence to, to settle their differences. So those are sort of things that we have to do. Um, and lastly, I, I really think we need to say, well, listen, how do we hold um, services to account, public services, yeah. and politicians? You know, the ballot box is a really key part of that. We really need to come together and say, listen, how do we hold politicians to account? Because to be quite honest, um, the, the politicians have, a, uh, I, I believe, need to be shown for what they are. Yeah. They, they talk, they, they don't even talk a good job anymore. And they treat people like fools that will accept anything they say. So, you know, th those are the sort of things we need to vote. Please, yeah. the local elections are coming. Please vote for the right sort of people, um, for councillors. And, um, you know, please, I, I've got my little registration card. Please vote for these sort of people and get active in your politics. Um, we in the Caribbean, African Caribbean communities are not that active. Yeah. Um, if you look at Asian communities, trust me, they are active. Um, I was involved in the Sadiq Khan campaign. It's the only campaign I've been involved in in depth. And um, I was amazed how they got that critical mass um, to really show their presence and their influence in things. And, um, you know, we need to try things differently. I, I was at church with a uh, called SPAC Nation. I don't know if you've uh, heard mm -hmm. of it. Um, and it's doing some great stuff engaging the, the hardened youngsters who are into crime and violence yeah. and been in prison, et cetera. And, um, you know, I, I really believe faith communities really need to step up. Yes. You know, the, the church has been absent without leave yes. since because of their absence. And I really hope that churches really understand their role. And our Youth Violence Commission um, evidence session on Monday really shows that churches need to, to be... They have to show faith in action, basically. And that's and I, yeah. I have to think that's happening more and more. And that's true because uh, recently, uh, when my pastor and my church were talking about what do we want to see happening in the church and what uh, people want to see as programs, I put my hands up and said, "I live in Lucian, and uh, knife crime is something." And he said, "Silburn, let's organize it." So I'm putting together some a summit, which is going to be called uh, SOS. Solution oriented summit and, and Leroy, you're booked on the panel, so just to let you know that. <laughs> oh, right. okay, okay. But, that, but also, I think it'd be good to get Vicky Foxcroft, um, MP, she's the local MP for one of the local MPs for Lewisham. Yeah, you know, she's doing some really great stuff. You know, um, she's 
she's got a real desire and, and she works very hard yeah. uh, for our community. So, you know, even if it's get her and, and, you know, I'm sure the members of the London Independent Youth Safety Advisory Board yeah. that I'm proud to chair will, will do that. But, you know, watch this space. We, we realize it's practitioners, people power is going to make this difference to hold our public services to account, including those politicians, and get their head out the Brexit cloud and start getting, sm smelling the real coffee of what's happening on our streets yeah. here and now. Okay. Well, Leroy, listen, I want to thank you so much for, for coming on tonight and um, for just listening to you and the, the breadth and wit and length of your experience as a former senior police officer, superintendent, commander of Hackney uh, with Scotland Yard. And only you know it, not I. And we, a lot of persons have made comments. I hope at some point when, if your wife gives you permission, you can go and look at some of the comments and respond to some of them because I'm going to read through some of them after this. Um, but okay. persons have been engaging with the discussion as well, uh, as much as possible, Leroy. And, uh, and yeah, I, I'm with you, you know, from my perspective. Let me know, I'll, because we, we've got to... You, you know, Leroy, some people say to me sometimes, uh, Sibber, you need to go home and get into politics, you know? And I say, yeah, yeah. But I say to them, listen, I've got two children here in the UK, man. And I look around and I see many people looking like me, you know what I mean? And it's something you can't just run away, just like you said. You could be in Montego Bay. I could be in Ochoa, you know what I'm saying? Mm. But we've got a high call, and we've got to follow that too, Leroy, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, you, ne you never know. Maybe we need to do a joint act, so you <laughs> don't discount that possibility. But, but just, just in closing, I just want to um, thank you very much for the opportunity to um, have this conversation. Um, I've never done a, a Facebook Live interview before, so it's the first. Yeah. So very well done for, for doing that. And, um, you know... The, discussing some hard truths. Um, you know, I think it's important that we get an understanding of this. You know, I can tell you and you'll forget. If I show you like this sort of uh, medium, then you will remember. And hopefully through the conversation, we'll understand. And more importantly, how we all can contribute, which I think is. So well done for doing that. Yes, uh, I, I would like to think we can do it again sometime. Oh, yes, definitely. And you know, re report back on what we were doing um, with the Violence Commission and, of course, the um, London Independent Youth Safety Advisory Board, all these sort of things. And hopefully it'll help us communicate what we're doing so people, more and more people can get involved. And, um, you know, I, I would like to think communication is the key. Yes. And this is part of the key. Okay. All right, Leroy. Thank you so much, sir. And have a... Take care. Have a and good keep one. up the good work. Yes. And you'll have to give me a crash course now to do this myself. Don't worry, don't worry. It's all free. It's on the house, Leroy, so we can't be lit up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Take Thank care. You, sir. Cheers. Bye-bye. All right. Cheers. Bye now. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Leroy, for coming on. And uh, it was a very good and uh, a powerful discussion. And um, I'm just looking over on Instagram, Lan, and I just want to to read out um, some comments which have been here. I think it's very important. Um, you know, uh, what, what, what they said, someone said, did you know that a significant number of young people who are perpetrating these crimes grew up in Christian and Muslim families? Um, um, Sharon Thompson said, it's important people who care about communities put themselves forward. I've been a counselor for four years now. We must make sure our voices are heard. Young people need awareness, but parents need to also understand the reality of what it is like for young people in the UK in this age. Empowering Safety says, speak to your children, get to know their friends, be real about the pressures they're facing. Just because they go to church, it does not mean they're not immune from influences. Um, it's a pandemic. Engage with the school, make sure you show up for your children. Cut out this our uh, my time attitude. Our young people need us. Too many think that your contribution to politics is simply voting. It's holding them to account for their entire term and lobbying. Now that's the whole political aspect because I mentioned with Leroy about politics a while ago and um, you know, many persons may think that politics is about getting on the front line. But as um, someone said here, uh, uh, contribution to policies also holding them to account for the entire time lobbying seeking to get them recalled seeking to get them sacked if anything like that you know it's not 
they have been employed by the voters and by virtue of such they can be removed by the voters by different means. Faith leaders should be at the strategic table. In Birmingham there is a faith leaders group for the city. The difficulty is that the church usually represented by the Church of England and Black Church. Right? Um, someone said, I'm not waiting for no politician or no police to keep my young people safe. My youngest son got shot last year. The police attitude was diabolical. Thankfully, he survived. Six of my son's friends are dead. The youngest stabbed to death at 14 years old. My heart just hurts when I see people not taking the issue seriously. Right? Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting discussion. And I, I don't want it to be seen, ladies and gentlemen, as a, a, a talk shop, which ends, as Leroy said, communication is very key, and the reason why this platform is here. Um, June Allison said the village need to support each other, and that is a crucial. As I said to many people, what I'm from Jamaica. If I'm walking down the street in Ochoas or whatever like that, doing something wrong, or if I have my hat turned sideways, somebody will say, "I'm going to tell your father, fix your hats." You know, and I'd have to fix my hat because I fear the wrath of my father. You know, just one look from him, and that is it. Um, I say to people sometimes that I grew up um, in, in in a home where there's no expletives, but yet at the same time I hang around with friends. I went to school where there were expletives, where there were spliff and they smoke and everything like that. But I don't smoke and I don't spliff and I don't and I don't um I don't I don't swear. So that means to say that sometimes um, your, your, your peers and your influence around you sometimes takes a second place to the strength of influence that you have from your home. That's, that's me giving it from my perspective, and I'm sure many can relate to that. Someone says, so many desire change, so few want to work until it's home, Bev says. Um, excellent analysis, Leroy. Excellent, never pass your cell by date. The village, again, need to support each other, right? Somebody said, Courtney Hamilton said, he sounds anti-Brexit, so it's a good job he's not in politics. <laughs> you know, if you're hearing that, you're anti-Brexit. A Brexit will say you're anti-Brexit, not good, you're not in politics. Um, anyway, MJ Brown, the idea of fair makes sense because you're able to bring a solution to the root cause. Remove the fair and you remove the need for you to carry knives. Yes, the money issue is 100% on point. Social problems need to be addressed. Um, thank you, Dr. Leroy Logan, for sharing his thought. He's been very instructive. Thank you very much. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, there is um, a, a lot of um, things which are happening here. Um, Emperor and Sailor, thank you for covering this topic. It is needed. I hope you consider shining the spotlight on each of the facets, education, parental responsibility, solutions, start with the village. That's important. I will, as a matter of fact, tomorrow night, I might be going over to the States um, with Sue Ann Robinson, who is a contributor on Fox News and different network in the States. We're going to look at the world, um, Stephen Clark and uh, Alton Sterling, the way how enough is enough seem not to be getting through in America, whereby somewhat something is not going right in America in regards to um, these injustices. Black Lives Matter is, is, is rising up. Uh, as much as possible demonstration because of the 20 gunshots at Mr. Stephen Clark. Seven, I believe, to his back, shot in his back, killed. And uh, that is something there. So we may be talking about that with Sue and Robinson tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Easter Monday. Um, hope you're having a nice, good, wonderful Easter. And uh, so, so, so please tune in tomorrow night and please like like the, the Silburn um, TV uh, network, STVN, on Instagram, on Facebook. And listen, guys, let me tell you this. I'm going big. I'm going big with this, and I spoke it. I told my web designer, let's just go big. Let's just go big. Let's just go big. Um, there are five platforms. The Silburn TV show, which is the Red Chair. The Facebook Live, which I started just under a year now, which is uh, the late one. That's what it's called, the late one with Silburn. Um, the concept. Um, the Don't Go With The Flow series, it's on my page there. And of course, the In Review, which is the news program as much as possible at the House of Parliament. Guys, we've got to work together. We can do it. We support each other. You know, we step into our specialty and we grow as much as possible. And we, I don't like to say stay in your lane, but stay in the effective lane that you can be in uh, as much as possible. So, so without further ado, 
um, I want to thank you so much for joining. Uh, what, what did Juna say? Western privilege means that we expect in the system to raise our children. Parents need to be supported and we need to be present in every area of their life. Yes. I believe very strongly that um, we cannot wait for the state to help. Uh, listen, I'm a child care lawyer. I, I, I go to court. My job is removing children from parents or blah, blah, blah. Yes, I'm the bad guy sometimes. But I'm instructed by the local authority and the social services, which I'm a part of. And um, it's a part of a process. So I read a lot of things. I read a lot of things. I might not meet the children, but I read a lot of things before I go before the judge and present a case on behalf of a local authority, which I may be is assigned to. And it's not pretty out there, ladies and gentlemen. And it's the reason why I've got another side of the world process when it comes on to parenting. I can't recall my parents having a parenting assessment, but anyhow, that's the whole process. June Allison, thank you for your comment and your contribution. My crickets, as usual, uh, MGA Brown, um, or the Cummings, um, who is a part of the the, the Jamaica Diaspora Crime Prevention Project, Violent, Va Valentina Daniela, um, Courtney, Bev Jones, um, as well, Empowering, Sharon Thompson, thank you so much. We've got the link as much as possible on Instagram land. And I'm gonna, and Elijah Prophet, more England, um, and all everybody who was online tonight. Wanna to thank you so much. Have a wonderful Easter. Fitz for a daily, bless you. Have a wonderful Easter, and uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, and may he give you peace until the next time. Thank you very much, and have a super duper night. I'm Silver, and I'm out on the late one. Peace. <laughs>